That's just catchy right there. Good morning. Man, we having some church up in here today, right? It is great to be here this morning. My name's Jason Marlowe. If you're visiting with us for the first time ever, I'm the lead pastor here. And we are, as Chris said, excited, right? I was like, that's the word of the day, right? We're glorifying God and we're excited because we really are. And we're beginning a new series. Chris kind of showed you a little bit about this. I mean, how cool is that, right? This is really, really neat for us. It's a, it's a big step uh, for what we're doing, and it's really what we want to see, too, and, and coming from the pastor's standpoint, is this devotional. It's, I mean, we're using it in our life groups, but it's not just for life groups. This is for every single person here. Even if you're, this is, even, you're never going to come back here, right? Take this with you and, and read through it, right, and, and look at your life in this. This is going to take you through the entire 12 weeks, and each week is going to be leading up to what we're preaching on that Sunday. And what I'm really excited Excited, right? Because you can't say that enough this morning. What I'm really excited to see is what happens in this church, right? When everybody is focused on the same thing, right? Everybody's focused on praying the same thing. Everybody's focused on living out the same thing in our home studies. When we're sitting down doing our devotions with our wife or by ourselves or in our life groups. And hopefully you talk about this in your Sunday schools, right? And then you come in and we all just come ready and excited, Part of the day. It was like the Pee Wee Herman show. Remember when the little thing would come? That dated myself really bad with Pee Wee Herman there. There's some things you never think you'll hear in a Baptist church, and that's probably one of them. My bad. But this is it, right? I want you to do take this, though, and I want you to take it and apply it to your life, right? If you're in college, I see some of our college kids are in today. Take this, right? You can listen to the podcast, and you can stay kept up. But we're excited to see what God can do when we all get focused Right on the same thing. We're all focused in living out his purpose and what he has next for us. So I hope that you will take one of these. We'll have them out in the back. They'll be at the tent. The ushers will be handing them out to you. If you go to get your kids, we will send somebody down there, right, to get you. You cannot get out of here without having one of these orange things, right? And don't leave it in your car in your dash, right? I'll be able to tell because I'll see it because it's orange, right? You can take it hunting with you. It's hunting season. <laughs> We try to think of everything here, right? So, but we are, we, we are honestly, guys, it's, it's, it's not hyperbole for us to say that we're excited about what God's doing here and the things that um, this church is doing. And when I started thinking about all the places we had been, you, you saw kind of in the bumper, you saw all the different um, sermons that we've actually preached here. And we, when I think about it, and I wish, I would love to sit back and tell you guys that guess what, man? Three years ago, I started writing out all these sermons, right? And they all led up to this day, and it's all just fit together perfect, just the way I knew it would. I am not that smart. My wife will tell you I don't plan anything, right? I don't, I don't, I'm not married to Bobby. That people say amen to, right? I dropped the word, and nobody wants to say amen. The fact that I'm not organized, and everybody's like, preach it. Jeez, guys. But I didn't. But the beautiful thing is, and this is honest the truth, guys, if you, if you go to the website or if you've been here through those three years, you've been with us through that, it's amazing to sit back and watch how every sermon series has built on another, right? And it's really, it's taken us to where we are today. And I, this, this whole idea of, you know, what's next I'll never forget, um, I did my seminary, you know, did it through online, through Liberty, and, and, it, and all these different things. But I did it while I was working 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, and while we had a small three-year-old, Grace. I would get up every morning at, at 4 o'clock so I could do all of my school stuff before Grace and Emily started getting up to start the day. So I'd get up at 4 to make sure I got everything done, had my time like that. And then at 9 o'clock, when everybody went to sleep, I would stay up from 9 to midnight just doing school stuff, right? Did that for two and a half years. Two and a half years, I'm not saying that for you, because I know a bunch of you are, are doing that now, right? Some people are going through that now, doing the school and, and doing all this thing and working, right? So you, you feel my pain. I'll never forget when I got all my credits and I was ready to get my big seminary degree and it all came, right? And, and I was like, well, that's it, I'm done. What's, what's next, right? I looked at Emily and she goes, well, what are you going to do now? I said, think about maybe getting my doctorate. And she said, no, you're not. <laughs> God told me you're not. 
But you know, the piece of paper came in the mail. You know what? I mean, I love seminary. I'm not talking. I, I, seminary was right for me, and I needed that, and it's helped me, and, and it helped develop me, and helped me grow in my relationship with God, and it had all these good things. But I got that piece of paper, right, the little, the little thing in the mail with my diploma, and I pulled it out, and I was like, well, put it in the closet. What's next? You see, we have, sometimes we have these big ideas and these goals, right? We all do that, right? We have these goals in our life, and then something happens, and the, the event comes, and the day comes, and you're like, all right, now what? You see, over the last three years, we've done nothing but prayed about, God, send us the people, send us the workers, send us people who don't want to sit on a pew, send us people who want to be a part of something bigger than themselves, send us people who want to go out and work, send us people who are burdened and broken for the same things that you are burdened and broken for, and he has done that. And now the thing comes for us, we're here, now what? Right? Do we just get excited that God has done all these things? I mean, we see more growth in the church, right? And some of the greatest things that have happened in this church, and this church has seen in years, right? And I don't say that because of me. It's because we're glorifying God. It's because the people, the, the staff, the deacons, the volunteers are praying and reaching out to God every single day and saying, use me, right? Because every morning when somebody comes here to church, they think, how am I going to glorify God today? And we have this awesome thing. And what's happened in these last couple years is God has provided lots and lots of living stones. Uh, Peter writing, Peter was one of Jesus' disciples. And he wrote a couple of, of letters that we have in the Bible. There are books in the Bible, First and Second Peter. Because it's just easier that way to name them, right? But one of his letters to the church in Rome, he said, We are living stones of the church. Right? Tucker Seeds Church is, Tucker Seeds Baptist Church is, is not this, right? As pretty as this is, this is not anything. This is a building, right? If this burned down tomorrow, this church would not cease to exist. We'd just be a little hotter, right? Well, not because we're in here when it's burning because it's no air conditioner. I'd <laughs> probably need to explain that. But the thing is, is God's given us all these living stones. And the thing about this series, these next 12 weeks, is I've sat down and just for months poured over and, and prayed and looked at the book of Acts and the New Testament church and what made them different, what set them aside. And we kind of recognized, and I, and I sat down with other pastors and other people in the church and talked about it and said, these, these are things that I recognize. I mean, there's tons of things that we see, right, in the New Testament church, but what are the core values, the core traits, characteristics of the New Testament church that we see lived out through the book of Acts. And what we're going to do for the next 12 weeks is we're going to go through those six core things that we recognized, okay? And there's also from those six core things, there's six actions, right? Because you don't have a true trait or a true characteristic, right, that does not manifest itself in an action, all right? If somebody says about somebody in their character, that's a good man. You know how they say that? Because he does good things, so we're going to look at these things that a New Testament Christian, right? When I say church, I'm not saying tuck a siege. I mean you, right? Wherever you are, if you're here today and you're part of tuck a siege, great. If you're here today but you go and you're part of another church body, great. But what we're going to talk about is how does God see us? How do we take all these living stones and put them together, right? And put them together in a way that fits, that takes us to the next level. That takes us to where God wants us to be. And really when I started this uh, kind of series off and I really started looking at it, it really came to me. There's this beautiful picture, right? Because we all have this thing, right? This, what now? What am I supposed to be doing now? And there's really, actually, if you ever read the book of Acts in the, the first part in um, chapter 1, there's this beautiful picture, right, of the disciples standing around going, okay, what now? I uh, put in your notes and you'll see it, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 11. And as we get ready to get started, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We like to do that here at Tucker Siege. It makes me happy. It gives me a chance to get some water, but also makes you understand how important we think God's Word is here. Acts chapter 1. We're going to go verses 6 through 11. And Jesus, to kind of give you context, Jesus has um, resurrected. This is the end. He's at the mount, and he's getting ready to ascend back into heaven. Okay, and he's giving this kind of final marching words to his disciples, to this inner circle. Okay, and he says these words. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, this is the disciples, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And this is God's word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you that it's useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting so that your servant will be provided for all the good works that you have set aside for them. God, I pray now that your word would cut us to the quick, divide us even between soul and spirit, bone and marrow. God, I pray the distractions that we've brought in here will be taken away, that our focus will be completely and solely on you. God, open our eyes that we could see you, our ears that we would hear you, and our hearts that we would understand your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So you kind of see that we have this what now moment with the disciples, right? They're all standing around, right? And he says, and they're like, all right, you're resurrected. You see, they grew up in, in the Jewish tradition, right? And the Messiah is going to come. Jesus, uh, the Christ is going to come. The anointed one's going to come, right? And he's going to rescue his people. He's going to set everything right. They were in bondage right now to the empire of Rome. And they're like, this is it, right? You ready to set your kingdom up? And he's like, no, that's not what's next. But you're Jesus. You're resurrected. Do your thing. No, because that wasn't what was next. He says, this is what's next for you. You are going to be my witnesses in Judea, in Jerusalem, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, right? And then, whoosh, ascends up into heaven. Just backed up this big dump truck of responsibility and said, hey, guess what? You, 11 guys. Guess what your job's going to be? You're going to tell the entire world about me. There was no flow chart, right? There was no instruction manual. You know, if you look under your rock, you'll find, no, right? This is it. You're going to be my witnesses. What's a witness do? You're going to tell what you've seen. Bye-bye. You can understand why when Luke writes about this, he talks about the disciples are just standing there going, He's coming back. He's just playing. Right? He's, you know, they're just standing there, right? You ever been to a concert, right? And you're like, I know they're going to play, they're going to play an encore. We're going to stay. Come on. Come, come, come. They're, they're really not coming back. Dang it, I'm stuck in the traffic now. Right? They were like, come on, right? You're coming. You're going to, you, you. And the angel's like, hey, what you doing? Well, the same Jesus that you saw ascend in the same manner will descend. Now go, run along, do what he told you to do. What? Isn't this it? This is what we've been waiting for, right? But you see, Jesus has greater things planned for his disciples. As a matter of fact, if they would have paid attention, right, before this moment came in John chapter 14, I put this in your notes, he told them. In John 14 too, he tells his disciples, he says, guess what? I tell you the truth that anyone who has faith in me will do what I have done. In fact, he will do even greater things than these. And I think that it's okay to understand, right, that the disciples may not have got that because they had seen this dude do great things. You know, he's just playing. We ain't going to do greater things. But he had greater things for them to do. You see, church, just like that, just like the disciples were called to a greater purpose, he is calling us to a greater purpose today. He has bigger and greater things planned for us. You see, what happens in greater things when we understand that we're called to a greater purpose is it moves you past the status quo. 
You see, that's what happens in churches. That's one of the biggest fears that I have as a pastor, especially when things are, are going good and things are happening, right? And I reiterate this over and over to our pastoral staff. They hear it from me at least once a week or once a month. When we go to our, our pastor's retreat, this is the only thing I talk about is we can't stop. We can't get excited and happy and say we've reached it because here's the thing. We're just now reaching baseline of where we should be. We're at the st- we did all this for three years to get to the starting gate. Now we're ready to do the greater things, to move forward in the purpose that Jesus has for us. You see, what happens is sometimes what happens in our ministry, and we think about this, is that really baseline becomes kind of this comfortable thing that we have. There's a reason that um, some people refer to the church as the chosen frozen, right? Right? We get, ex- we're, we're, now we're just here, right? We get comfortable with what we're doing. And what happens is when we get into comfortable complacency, it turns into miserable mediocrity. Easier for me to say, right? Becomes miserable mediocrity. Comfortable complacency becomes miserable mediocrity. And what I mean by that is stuff that you used to love to do, right? Teaching the kids, reading your Bible, coming to church. It's no longer something that you get to do and you're excited about. It becomes something that you have to do because you've lost sight of the greater purpose. You see, we become stuck in this mediocrity and we start to settle for good enough. Right? You've heard me say it over and over. Good is the enemy of great. Right? If we're going to move forward and do the next things, we're going to have to dare to be great. All right? And there's a catch. Right? There's a catch to this daring to be great. He's not calling us. He's not saying, you see that? He's going to, he says, you're going to do greater things than me. He didn't say, Jason, you're going to do greater things than me in you. Right? He's not telling us that we're going to do greater things through ourselves. You're going to do, we're going to do, the only way we're going to do greater things is through Him. The only way we are greater is through Him. There's a reason Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ. There's a, I'm, I'm going to teach on this one day, and there's a sermon series I'm, I'm in the process of putting together through Philippians. But it's interesting in Philippians, there's this idea. Do you understand the New Testament, that the New Testament writers, the Holy Spirit in writing the New Testament, refers to what we are as followers of Christ, as Christians, twice. We get our identity as Christians twice in the New Testament. 216 other times the New Testament refers to us and our identity as in Christ. You see, we do greater things through Him and when we're in Him. And here's the kicker, right? Jesus' plan for us is greater than we can imagine. It's greater than we could ever think, but it's really simple, right? And it's greatness. Reach the world. Jesus is calling us to reach the world, right? That's what He said. This is the Great Commission. This is one of the things that defines us as a church. We say at Tucker Siege Baptist Church, there are two greats in the Bible, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. The Great Commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the Great Commandment. The Great Commission is just what we read, right? It's a combination of Matthew 28 and Mark 16 and Acts 1-8. It's go and tell. You will be my witness. See, the thing about the Great Commission, the thing about the Great Commandment, the thing about what we're doing at Tucker Siege is you ain't got to pray about it. Man, that's, you know, we did uh, nominating and we're getting, getting all that stuff set up and getting ready to ask for our volunteers in a couple of weeks, we're going to have Cannonball Sunday, which is our big volunteer jumping off thing, right? Where you get to sign up and say, this is where I want to serve. This is where I think I can, you know, contribute to what God's doing at Tuck of Siege. And for years, right, if you served on a straight Baptist um, nominating committee or personnel committee, you go to ask somebody, hey, we, you know, can you help us here? We'll pray about it. Right? That's the, you know, like in the South, we say, bless your heart. And that means you can say anything bad about somebody you want to. In a church, you can say no. All you got to do is say, I prayed about it, right? When somebody tells me I'm going to pray about it, I'm just like, okay, I'm asking the next person. Because that's the answer I used to give. Here's the thing. The Great Commission, go and tell, reach the world. You ain't got to pray about it. 
Because he said, do it. <laughs> right? There's nothing. We, we need to vote on this because that's what we do. We need to decide if this is really what we think God wants. No, you will be my witness. Okay. It's really simple. But how do we live that out? How do we live out what we see as being something that's, that's so simple? And what we need to understand is that the New Testament church, when we start thinking about how are we going to do this, what's the plan, right? The New Testament church is our blueprint, right? How did they do all the stuff that they do? The New Testament church is our blueprint, and in them, they give us six traits, all right? We kind of went through and isolated these six traits. I'm not going to talk about all of them today because we're going to hit on them for the next 12 weeks, right? The six traits are pretty simple when we go through them. The early church, Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-powered, prayerful, faithful, worship, and committed. And I looked, and, and when you look at that, and we're actually going to start and really look at committed first because every single one of those is, is tied up in that word commitment, right? The commitment to God's purpose, a commitment to live out these traits. But this is a blueprint for us, and we see all of them revealed through specific actions. And we're going to talk about the actions that these go. But this is going to be the, the plan for us. And, and here's the kicker, all right? This isn't something that, um, you know, I, I got out of seminary. This isn't something that, you know, we just made up. I didn't read this from some dude's book. This is from the book. Right? When I first took over at Tucker Siege one time, and, and you have a lot of people asking you questions and trying to tell you different things, and the rule number one when you came into my office to talk to me about something, if you had a, a, a disagreement, we want to talk about something, the way something was going on is, you better tell me what the Bible says, not what you think. Right? Because I'm playing from this book. Right? When I do stuff, I do it out of this playbook. When I do stuff, it's from this plan. So when we talk about a Christ-centered church, a Christ-centered heart. That's us, where everything that we have revolves around, in, through, and by Him. Because why? Because without that, we're not going to be able to do anything. A Holy Spirit power church. Christ says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And the kids even know this in Vacation Bible School, that God has given you not a, a spirit and a, a spirit of timidity and fearfulness, but of power and love and self-control. You've got to have a body that is prayerful, all right? I mean, praying seriously for each other. You know, before we started our life groups, we really moved our Wednesday night prayer service downstairs, and we started sitting at small tables and small groups, and people were like, why are we doing this? And I said, because when we sit up here, everybody tells me their prayer request about Aunt Sally's big toe, right? But I can't pray for you and what you need in your life. God cares about Aunt Sally's big toe, Okay. All right, I'm not saying about that, but I'm talking about a people that get together and pray. And I mean pray honestly for each other. All right? Honestly and fully for each other. When somebody says, man, I need you to pray for this, you stop and you say, let's pray right now. Right? All right, dude, I'm pulling over on the side of the road. What you need? All right? A life that's lived like that. When you say, I'm going to pray for somebody, if you're apart, we have this thing called the loop, and it sends out these prayer things, right? When you get that, right, it doesn't go straight to your spam thing, that it goes straight to your front screen, and you say, i got to pray for this right now. And take a second. Faithful. Right? Full of faith. Understanding that God is in control. Understanding that God is sovereign. Putting it over and giving it to Him. Worship. All of these things, when you are Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-powered, prayerful, you're faithful, all of these things spill over into your worship. Why? Because it's just thanking God. It's praising God, which should be the natural reaction, right? Waitress comes by and fills up your sweet tea. What do you say? You say, thank you. That's worship. Right? You can say thank you. We say thank you for the most mundane things, right? The smallest things in life, but we forget to give praise and honor to God for the things that He does. And when you understand what He's done because you're centered on Him, because you understand the power of the Holy Spirit, because you're in prayer, because you know He's in charge, you can't help but shout and scream and raise your hands in praise, right? But all of these things, guys, all of these things are nothing if we're not committed to it. 
if we're not committed to living out these truths. If we don't say, you know what? I'm going to make an honest endeavor to live out what it is that we say we're about. I'm going to make an honest effort to go through this devotion and pray about it. I'm going to make an honest endeavor to pray about this because guess what? I am depending on you. And you depend on me. It's what being part of one body is. Each of us depends on each other. Right? I depend. I th- Thrive, I crave, I need your prayers and your commitment to the church, to God, and to the vision that he has for us and the things that we're going to do. And here's the thing, guys. This is a game changer for us. This is a game changer for the church. This is a game changer for my ministry because I've never just stepped out so much on faith and said, this is it, right? This is going to be sink or swim for me and my ministry. This is going to be sink or swim for, for, for where I see God leading us. And if this doesn't get off the ground, if this doesn't go, then I know God's dealing with me and I need to look in a different direction, right? I need to look at my life and my things. This is the plan that we have to really say, this is it. I want to see what happens in this. Does it mean that everything's going to go off great? No, right? But we're going to try it, Right? Why do we do the things that we do now? Look around you. There is nothing that's happened in these last three years that has not been prayed over, thought about, and implemented. Right? I never woke up in the middle of the night or one Sunday morning and said, this is what we're going to do. Right? And God has glorified it. Not me. Him. All right? And he's going to glorify us when we all do this. What if we take the same effort that three pastors put into this and we multiply it out times 180, 200 people doing this, praying for this, seeking this, God's will for this church, the next step for God's church. You won't be able to stop this place. Why? Because God has greater plans for us. You know, really and honestly, what I'm trying to tell you today is how serious we take the call to be greater is going to define Tuck a Siege Baptist for the next generation. Heck, for this generation, for the next year, for the next month, for next Sunday, all of that is going to be defined by how serious we take the call to be greater. Because the truth of the matter is this, guys. God's got bigger plans for his church. Bigger plans for his church than even we do, than even I could even sit back and could imagine. Bigger plans than I could even think of on the longest pastor's retreat. It's time for us to step up. It's time to get off the bench, right? It's time to get out of the sidelines. It's time to step up and say, I'm going to embrace this because it's time to be greater. Let me tell you this right now. The next steps for you, maybe it's going all into this. Maybe it's going all into what's going on. Maybe you're here as a follower of Christ. Maybe you're here for a member. Maybe you've been a member for 50 years or five minutes. And it's time for you to embrace what God's doing here. Not to just show up because you show up, right? I say it all the time. If you want to come and just sit, you're not going to be comfortable here. I'm going to make sure you're not comfortable here. I'm going to pray that you're not comfortable coming here and sitting. We are not just here at Tuck a Siege. We are doers. And maybe you're here and you need to embrace that. Maybe that's the next step for you is embracing what God has for you to do here. Maybe the next step you have is to come be a part of this. To come jump on board because you got something to offer that we need. Every single person here is here for a purpose. To help make us greater. To take us to the next step. Maybe though, don't miss this one. Maybe your next step is giving it all to God. Maybe your next step is surrendering every part of your life to him and saying, here it is right? I have completely messed this up. Or better yet, even the best I do is not good enough. Maybe you need to take the next step to say, here it is, God. It's a beautiful verse where Christ says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Maybe your next step is your first step out of that pew 
to come to an altar and pray, to pray for your marriage, to pray for your family, to pray for your coworkers, to pray for your church, to pray for your pastor, to pray for your Sunday school class, to pray for your life group. Maybe the next step for you is the first step you have to take today. I don't know what that is, but I will tell you this. Everybody, everybody here has a next step. What are you going to do with yours? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Not focusing on lunch or whatever's going on. Completely focused with your eyes closed on God and what He has for you and the words that He has for you. Love me, He says, with all your heart, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go and tell. God has called us to be love in action. What does your next step look like today? Don't not take it. Don't wait till tomorrow to take the next step. When we sit here today, be ready. Move out. Do what God is calling you to do. Don't leave here saying, man, I should have, I would have, I could have, but I didn't. Make the next step today. That's my prayer for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come here right now, Lord, people from all different walks of life, God, different socioeconomic education, places in our life right now, each and every person here, God, comes to you right now, and we need you. We need you to help us make the next step, to be with us and comfort us when we make the next step. God, I pray for those people who are making the step into living their life fully and completely for you that are taking hold. God, I pray that you would be with those people, Lord, who are wrestling with that, Lord, that they would let go of their life and say, no more doing it on my own. My next step is a step to the cross. My next step is a step to Jesus to let him take over my life. The Bible, God, you told us that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, we are saved. Right now, Father, people that are praying that in their heart, God, I want to be saved. I want to take that next step. And they confess you as Lord. Lord, they're taking that next step. Bring them, Holy Spirit. And there's others, Lord, that are wanting to take that next step. They're tired of being a pew sitter. They're tired of just comfort and mediocrity. They dare to be great and to be a part of what you're doing. We're putting aside preferences, God. We're putting aside what we want. And we're saying we are all into what you're doing here, God. And there's other people whose next step is the next step to join what you're doing here. They're here right now. They're a part of it. And they're plugged in, God. But that commitment isn't there just yet. Move as only you can as we sing, God. You are the God of this city. And you have greater things to happen. Greater things than we could ever imagine. And God, all of your people, we cry out to you right now. I cry out to you, God. You are the one true God. And we give you all the honor, praise, and the glory in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.